Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 117 of the podcast. And today I want to talk about dream achievements. We've been kind of on a kick of talking about uh, projects. We talked about um, working on things that are most important. We've talked about uh, prioritizing your UFOs, and then also on uh, just how much time a project's going to take, you know, how you can estimate that, how you can kind of look at a project and go, okay, I'm going to be working on that for a month, two months, six months, a year or longer. And so in this podcast episode, I'm kind of continuing on with this little tangent. And I want to talk about working on the projects that are the most important, the super, super special ones that are just they're life fulfilling. They are different from everything else because when you get something like that done, it's just, I don't know, it's scratching something up your bucket list and it feels different. You feel like um, that project is super, super special and it has made you a better quilter, a better person, a better wife, a better mother, a better everything. And this is exactly how I feel. The reason why I wanna share this with you guys is because this is exactly how I feel after accomplishing two major dream achievements this past month. Uh, first off, I have created a creativity journal and planner. I actually designed this and printed it out and it helped me get myself organized around writing my dream achievement, which was the goddess quilt book, Leah Day's goddess quilts. So I made, I ended up making two things I always wanted to create, a planner and a book that I've wanted to write for years and years. So in this podcast episode, I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about how to get yourself organized and oriented to make this happen. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit and show you uh, my planner so that way you can see how it can help you. The pre-orders for these are going to start in November, I think. We're still kind of, I'm, I'm still in that kind of negotiation phase of making sure I've got all my T's crossed and I's dotted and all that good stuff but I am so, so excited about this, guys. It is huge, it is amazing, I feel great. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I think I wanna talk about a lot, that there's, you know, there's just making stuff to make stuff, there's keeping your hands busy, there's, you know, um, in, in my case, it's, you know, like there's the quilts that I share to keep the lights on and the bills paid and that kind of good stuff. And then there's the things that we make that are like, I don't even care. I don't even care if no one wants a planner like this, I made it for me, <laughs> you know? Like, that's important enough as it is. Uh, and that's enough, uh, that making something for yourself, selfishly so, and I'm gonna say that word a lot, selfish, because I think that's one of those things that a lot of times we get stuck in kind of in a trap of making things for other people, and that's great and awesome, and I love making gift quotes, but, there's making something special for you too. And that's important because that's where you get that life fulfilling, amazing quality of making things for yourself that you need to create. And that's actually a line from the Goddess Quilt book. And that is making what my heart most needs to create. We need to tap into that. You know, there is, you know, there are projects that we make just to get it done and get it out of the, you know, off the sewing machine and get it out of our way. And then there's those things that we make because it's just like, oh my gosh, this is why I became a quilter. This is why I do what I do. And that's what I wanna to share today. So that's gonna be coming up later on and definitely check below the video for a timestamp if you want to jump right ahead and get straight to that. Um, so that's gonna be the theme and topic of the podcast. But at the beginning, I always share a little bit about what's going on around the house and do a little personal update. So today, you are in my kitchen with me as I make some carrot cake muffins. I think I'm gonna, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a mini carrot cake recipe that should only make two Ramkin carrot cakes, but I'm uh, playing with it a little bit so that way I can make a few more like mini muffins because I know James would not be happy with me if I only made two Ramkins and he didn't get one. <laughs> so yeah, I love this recipe. Uh, it is... I actually haven't made this recipe yet, but I love this cookbook. It's Comfort and Joy Cooking for Two by Christina Lane. I will link this up to Amazon so you guys can go check it out. If you are, have a small family, you know, one or two people in your household, this is the book for you because, you know, who wants to make a whole huge cake and then have to eat the whole thing? You know, this is a small batch recipes. So I will literally make like six muffins from this recipe. I'm gonna only have to grate 
two, like honestly, I think I only need to grate one carrot because uh, I only need a quarter cup of uh, grated carrots for this recipe. And you know, I was, I was thinking, oh man, I don't have enough carrots for this. And then I checked the recipe, <laughs> like quarter cup, I think I can do it. Yeah, so as you can tell, I am a bit pumped up. I am super, super happy. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, I am coming off of catching two colds back to back of the last two weeks. Finally, finally feeling better. And you know how, you know, it's like you just kind of feel icky and awful and stuff for so long. When you finally start to feel better, it's like, oh, just feel amazing. So yeah, that is the explanation for the slightly <laughs> more electrified Leah that you're getting today. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, and if you can hear this, I am grating a carrot right now, guys. This is just how my podcast goes. I make a lot of noise. Sorry. Um, yeah, I really wanted to make this. And it's actually kind of a funny thing. I was not planning on making carrot cake muffins right now, but I cracked an egg for James. I was making him eggs and sausage for breakfast this morning before school. And I split the yolk. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was runny and he likes now, he, now it took, it took 10 years, but now he likes over easy eggs the same way Josh and I do. And so he hates it when they're scrambled. I was like, oh, I could just make you a scrambled egg. He was like, no. And this is a kid that was a diehard scrambled egg fan for, yeah, 10 years. No, won't have it anymore. So I cracked him another egg. I mean, we've got 36 chickens in the yard right now. Josh did a count recently. I was like, I think we have a few too many. This is, this is a bit much. He's like, no, nah, I kind of like this number. 36 is a good number. But anyway, uh, so we have plenty of eggs. We are getting upwards of 20 eggs a day right now, which is insane. So I'm looking at like, all right, I need to just use up eggs. So I cracked James another egg, did it right that time, made him an over easy egg. And then now I have got that scrambly one that I was like, oh, I get to make something with that. I guess I get, you know, this is my excuse to go try this carrot cake muffin recipe. I love it. <sighs> so what have I been up to today? This morning I got up and I got another chapter narrated from my goddess quote book. Um, so <laughs> a little bit about this kind of crazy tangent I've been going on. Um, I have, this is the first time I have ever done a multiple uh, editions of a book before it's even launched. Uh, so I have the regular goddess quilt book and I'll be showing this to you a little bit later on in the podcast. Um, but I've got the regular goddess quilt book and then I've done a large print edition. And then of course we'll do an ebook edition and then the audiobook edition. And I'm, I've been recording that. I had to take a week off. Like I said, I, I got sick and you can hear it, uh, you know, in your voice when you get sick, you kind of get scratchy throat and kind of just, it, there's like a flimmy sound and I could hear it. So I was like, all right, I can't keep recording. And uh, so I had to take all last week off from recording and then got back to it this week. And I only have a third of the book left to do, but this last third, the chapters are really long. You know, the parts are really long. So I managed to do that read. Uh, I just got one of them done. I was like, all right, that's enough. You know, it's, it, it, I, I seem to find that, you know, I need to get in my groove with it and then I can get faster. But until I get in my groove with it again, I'm going to be, you know, like one chapter, maybe two chapters a day. And that's probably plenty. And then I, when I start to feel it in my throat, um, like just a subtle pain in my throat, I know to stop because I pushed it too hard one day and then my throat hurt for like three days later. So I'm being really, really careful not to hurt myself. Uh, and I got an audiobook about reading audiobooks. It's called Storyteller. And that was one of the tips. It was like, you're, when you're narrating, and this is something I really want to get into and I want to do a lot. I'm going to read Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt next after I get done with this. Um, but I'm really excited about it. And I, you know, you treat your voice like an instrument, like, you know, like it's special. And whenever I can feel that my, it's, I'm not coming out the right way, then it's like, all right, it's time to stop. So yeah, that one <laughs> tiny carrot was enough to do my quarter cup of grated carrots for this recipe. I love it. Uh, so I've got another one. So if this is really good, then I'll just make more carrot cakes maybe tomorrow. We'll say, like I said, I just love this cookbook because it's so fast and easy and I can just whip something up. I have been lately on a cinnamon kick and cinnamon is going in everything. And I think that has to do with the voice narration stuff too, where I'm 
cinnamon, I think, is a medicinal herb for, you know, that kind of helps your throat and, and, and respiratory stuff. So I don't know why, but I have been craving cinnamon like crazy, more, way more than I ever usually do. So uh, I've been just leaning into that and I've been doing cinnamon rolls and there's a cinnamon res roll recipe in this book that literally makes four cinnamon rolls exactly. Like no more, that's it. You just make four cinnamon, roll cinnamon rolls. Unfortunately, that doesn't divide evenly through my family. <laughs> So we always end up with, you know, there's an extra roll. So who's going to get it? You know, that whole thing. So that's really funny. And uh, I, I, I had the extra roll twice. And then, and both times, James like has a radar for that. And he was, he came in the room and was like, you're eating the cinnamon roll that was left. <laughs> and so I ended up splitting it with him. I'm being good. And I, following up, this is a, an old, a old podcast episode from, I think it was last year. Last year, I went on a diet and really cut out sugar. I went on Whole30 for 30 days and cut out all sugar. And then I've kind of been like more or less on keto now for, you know, since then, basically. You know, I found keto was a lot more flexible as far as what I could eat. And I, you know, I love the healthy fats and I love, um, I love those foods. So that's worked out really well. And I've kind of said, all right, gluten's okay in moderation. And the way I, I kind of feel like I'm all right eating this because I'm making it myself. You know, I also kind of, I've, I've kind of gotten a little bit lax with it. I'll be completely honest. But I am not going back to regular sugar. I am using Swerve. And this is not like a product placement or anything here, guys. But Swerve is erythritol and stevia mixed together it's like they had babies and it's pretty good i mean it's not it's not sugar sugar but it is a one-to-one -one replacement so that i can make this and i don't have to worry about it being you know i don't have to worry about doing some crazy math on any you know regular recipe i can just spoon this out just exactly like sugar and it works so i really like that and you know i think with anything you just have to figure out what works and I have found, you know, number one, focusing on, you know, if I want a dessert, I make it myself. And then two, it's okay for the, I found that gluten-free flour plus swerve doesn't taste good. It's not good. Um, that, that's not a good combination. You can, you can substitute one thing. You can't substitute more than one thing. And there's something about uh, gluten-free flours. They just don't taste quite right. I'm still working on that. You know, I, I'm still working on that. But James, whenever I do something that has both, he always takes one bite of it and he's like, you just made this keto, didn't you? <laughs> the, the look of absolute tragedy on his face is always hilarious. He's just so upset with me whenever I do that. So what else has been going on? Uh, I know in the last podcast, I talked about a hot air balloon ride. Unfortunately, that didn't end up happening. Uh, the farm that was having their fall festival, I don't know, I don't know, something got, some ball got dropped and the hot air balloon didn't end up coming and I was super, super disappointed. But I just decided, you know what, this is a, this is a dream achievement. I've wanted to get on a hot air balloon and do this thing for quite some time and I really wanted to make it happen. So I looked around in my area and turns out there is the Carolina Balloon Festival is coming up in October. It looks super, super crowded and that's not really my beat anymore. So I just decided I'll just contact one of those balloonists and have a private balloon ride scheduled. So we've got that scheduled for November and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, we could go to the balloon festival. It's not very far away. But I just really like the idea of it being, you know, just chill, fun time, me, Josh, and James get up super, super early because turns out you only ride hot air balloons at dawn or dusk because that's when the air currents are the least crazy. So yeah, I've learned a lot about hot air balloon riding. <laughs> so this is gonna be a lot of fun. And the reason why I feel like this is super important is because I'm starting Mally book two and the uh, working title right now is Mally the Maker and the Friendship Quest. I'm super excited about it. And uh, part of it is Mally is gonna need transportation. And so she's gonna have a hot air balloon and I'm, I'm I'm just delighted, you know, like this is kind of um, 
I don't know, it's, it's a cool way of mixing things together where I'm, I'm kind of mixing up the things that I wanted to do, like write a hot air balloon, and then put that in my story. So then now I have a nice excuse to go write a hot air balloon. <laughs> so, I love that. That's just making me super happy. So I'm hoping that the weather will be good. You know, if it's raining or if it's really, really windy, then that will get canceled. But um, yeah, that's on the list. And speaking of making things special, I actually turned my own measuring spoons. I am so delighted with this, guys. Uh, so I haven't been turning in several months. It's been just way, way too hot out in the, my wood shop. But I made these. This was the last thing I made before I just kind of said, all right, that's enough. Shutting everything down. And I love them. And I hang them up. I keep them hanging right here so that way I can see them. And it's just like, you know, it's like that thing that you have hanging in your house that just fills your bucket every time you see it. And I just love that. So I'm thinking that these will make really nice Christmas gifts. So I'm gonna get a couple more sets and start turning those. It is slowly starting to cool down a little bit, not much. Um, I had a little bit of scare with my bunnies getting too hot. So I just decided, you know what, until it actually really cools down, I'm just gonna leave the AC on. I'm just gonna leave it running. You know, because uh, it's, you know, it's been getting upwards, you know, the rabbit ritz, I think it's the way the sunlight moves around the yard. It was getting upwards of 100 degrees in there, you know, when I didn't catch it. So I was just like, yeah, just leave the AC on, it's fine. Uh, and I checked my electricity bill, and here's what's funny, adding the rabbit ritz and AC, I'm not sure, you know, why exactly, but we are using less electricity than we did the year before, so, hey, yay, you know, that was my dad's criticism of the rabbit ritz. He didn't think it was gonna work, number one, and then number two, he was like, oh, that's gonna be really expensive on an energy to, you know, put an AC unit in your rabbit hutch, basically. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to prove him wrong that it didn't end up working out that way at all. Um, so yeah, I kind of feel like, you know, make him cool. I just had a little scare. One of them kind of started looking a little sick. Soon as I cleaned out, you know, cleaned up poo and pee, I have a nice flush flushable system in my Ritz. Um, so got that cleaned out and then turned on the AC and then completely cleared up. Like the next time I went out there, he was kind of like just totally normal again. And I was freaking out, you know, that something was really wrong with him. And he was totally, totally fine. So that was just an, uh, a, a, a nice lesson in, you know, just go with the simplest thing first. Uh, so that was really cool. And uh, I'm hoping to renovate in there and get space for five more cages and then also work on my outside uh, little rabbit hutch too. Uh, so that way I can start breeding my bunnies, but that is, that's on the list. You know, it's not really, I've got like a long list of things to work on this month. So I'm kind of just saying, all right, well, maybe that'll be like a weekend project. Uh, as I can get to it, I will tackle renovating and, and refinishing that because basically I need to kind of hang hangers for more cages and then build another poo and pee slide so that way that is not a problem because it's you know it gets to be really gross <laughs> really really quick so what else is on the list this week uh, I have been having so much fun playing with QCT so that is quilters creative touch and it has basically made my long arm automatic so that my long arm now moves by itself. Well, kind of. I, uh, I program in the design, I pick a design, I tell it where it's gonna go, and then I hit start and it stitches itself out and the, the long arm machine is moving. And you know, the best way to think of that is like an embroidery machine, you know, how an embroidery machine moves the hoop, only this is the long arm has a motor now attached to the carriage and it is moving, uh, it is moving the machine and frame. Uh, so really cool stuff. Uh, and you know, every once in a while in the back of my head, I'm like, this is cheating. I get that like little <laughs> negative voice in my mind. It's like, this is cheating. You're not doing it yourself. You're not, you know, quilting on the marked line or whatever. And then I think about all the years that it took me, and I'm sorry guys, it was years, straight up. It was absolutely years to get really confident and solid with free motion quilting. And even, you know, I look back on the original 365 designs, the first hundred designs, I stitched those out a second time to take good photos for the book. 
So even in 2009, I started quilting in 2005. In 2009, I was still very much, you know, a beginner slash intermediate at free motion quilting. It takes a lot of time and dedicated effort in order to gain the skill that you need to have in order to do that. And, um, you know, quite frankly, not everybody has the time. And that's okay. That's what, you know, QTC or just the other day, I got an email um, with an image of a frame designed to go around an embroidery machine. You know, and when I look at that and I compare costs, because embroidery machines, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and very, very, very expensive. Um, you know, this is fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for the embroidery machine. The little frame that went around it was only two hundred dollars, but that's still not going to do what a long arm with automation can do because you're still limited by the hoop with an embroidery machine. You still have to clamp your quilt in a hoop, and that hoop is still the thing that moves. So even putting a frame around it, you know, it's just a lot of. When I saw that, I was like, that's a lot of clunk, you know, clunkiness, for you know, now that I have experienced the QTC software and, and kind of played around with that, for what I, I see now, that's the better way to go because that's going to get your quilt quilted. If your goal is pantographs or your goal is just, you know, picking individual block designs or whatever your goal is, if it's just simple quilting, utilitarian quilting, uh, or even some fancy stuff. I mean, you can get some really fancy designs for QTC, uh, QCT. Uh, that's a lot easier than doing that on an embroidery machine, even with one of those elaborate frame things hung, you know, going up around it. Uh, so yeah, it's just really changed my perspective more than anything else. I, uh, I love it. And to me, this is making me more creative and more prolific. You know, and being productive is an important part and a, an important aspect for me, but not every quilt needs for me to hand guide it and do that stitching. You know, not every quilt is that special. I've got, like I've said, you guys, I've got 50 quilt tops in this house and I just ran across a bag of another 12. <laughs> so that count was actually wrong. It's more like 62. Yeah, that was not a good day. I, I realized that I had actually, you know, pulled together a whole bunch of quilt tops and kind of stashed them off in another corner. I told you about that last, you know, last podcast. You can be really, we can hide these things from ourselves. And that's what I had done. It's crazy. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be even more quilt tops to get knocked out. And that means, you know, even more stuff than I need to finish, you know, having automation and have, having that where I can program it and do, you know, two rows of pantographs. Kind of my goal right now is learning the pantograph part of the software and figuring that out. Um, you know, and that's just a, a process of trial and error. I'm probably going to have a guinea pig quilt or two that I just not all that great, you know, not going to turn out perfect, but I will figure out how everything works and I understand the placement, kind of get it all logged into my head. And I'm at this point, I'm kind of looking at this going, you know, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't necessarily have time to go and intensely stitch everything myself. And in a lot of ways, this is helping me quilt bigger and quilt faster and get more done. So all of that is good. None of that is cheating, in my opinion. Uh, and as far as the cost, I've kind of compared the cost of those big giant embroidery, embroidery machines. Like I said, those prices are somewhere between you know fifteen and twenty thousand um, dollars. A you know, a continuum frame and uh, a long arm. Even we have had prices increase just recently. It's still less. You know, adding the software, you know, maybe the 15R, which is our 15 inch long arm, uh, the software, that's going to give you more space to quilt in. You can quilt across the full length of your quilt, depending about on the size of the continuum frame you set up. And you don't have to worry about hooping or any of that kind of fiddly nonsense that you have to deal with with an embroidery machine. So yeah, it's cheaper to go with the long arm, even though it takes up more space. And I think it's just mentally, you know, I, I think of an embroidery machine, I think of small, you know, and I have mine set up and it's kind of got its own little niche now, uh, but it's still small, much, much smaller than a long arm. But now these are being really advertised to do almost the same things, but a long arm is a better choice. Anyway, that might be a, an episode for another day just to talk about that. 
you know, specifically, if you guys are interested, you know, if you want me to break down kind of what I'm seeing, you know, this is kind of, you know, I'm, I get a lot of different industry newsletters and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm kind of responding to what catches my eye. And when I see something like this, I'm always just kind of like, huh, you know, like, okay, you know, a frame for an embroidery machine, I guess that makes sense, but why not just get a long arm with automation? It's gonna be cheaper and it's gonna be bigger though, that's the one downside, but it's going to end up being cheaper cost-wise and probably give you what you want and be easier to do it. You know, it will actually do what you want faster and easier. So, you know, something I'm thinking about. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of this stuff can get really confusing because we don't see a lot of this stuff in stores. You know, uh, I mean, embroidery machines, yes. Possibly the frame setup, yes. But long arms and automation, I don't know that I ever saw one and really experienced it and like played with it until I hung out with Grace Company last year in their booth at Festival. So, you know, it's just not, it's not as common to see it set up or at least not common to see it set up and then actually learn how to use it as I would say embroidery is. Embroidery is much more, I think embroidery is just, it's just um, supported more I feel like by dealers. That's just my opinion again, and that's only based on my opinion based on Shelby, North Carolina. <laughs> so not a very far reaching opinion by any means, but you know, that's just what I'm thinking about. Uh, and speaking of embroidery, I have been really thinking about, you know, get kind of tapping into that and doing more design work. The QTC software is really making me want to do some creative design work. And I am working on a really cool fabric panel that is, I'm hoping will be out in time for Christmas for us to make something fun uh, for the Christmas season. Let me go grab a picture of it. So here she is. This is a goddess angel. I'm kind of, I don't know. I've just been really feeling nostalgic. Um, I haven't gone to church in many, many years but I'm thinking about looking for a church in my local area and uh, certainly kind of tapping into more of those themes and sharing that. I was raised Quaker in uh, where I grew up and yeah, it was just, it was something that I kind of stepped away from. I haven't gone to church in 20 years and then now I'm kind of going, maybe I want to do that again. You know, maybe I want to get back into that. So uh, the angel, I just really kind of with all of my goddess quilts, it's always just like, what is my inspiration? What am I thinking about right now? And she just kind of sketched up real easy, real quick on the page. And then I'm playing around with two different background images here. Um, this one's like radiating lines, and this is more of kind of an Art Nouveau um, stained glass effect is really kind of what I was going for with this one. I'd love to know which one you guys like better because this is going to be a fabric panel. I'm not going to do this as a pattern. I'm kind of done writing patterns. They're just really, really time consuming to write. It's so much easier to just come up with a fabric panel. Uh, so that's what I'm thinking as a fabric panel. And I'd love to know which one you like, guys like better. Do you like the one with the kind of radiating sunburst or do you like the one with the more of a stained glass effect? Uh, so that is on my list and I have been playing with new design software to come up with more colors because here's the thing that has always, always been a pain when it comes to designing fabric, designing fabric panels is I want, I want that same look of a solid reading batik. Uh, that's my favorite kind of fabric. And, uh, you know, a solid color, if I, if I just pick a solid color from, uh, you know, from the paint palette, it does not come out right. It does not look the way I want it to look. Uh, so what I've been doing, I've been experimenting with different design software and I finally figured out how to paint my own repeatable patterns, which is super exciting. Uh, so yeah, just yesterday I was playing and playing and playing with the software and I came up with uh, over 75 colors to work with. And you know, Josh was like, well, how many colors do you need? And I started thinking, I was like, I need as many colors as I could possibly ever want. You know, I mean, this is my, this is my paint palette basically. And I don't want to be limited by only having, you know, three colors of blue or whatever. I want to have every possible color that I am going to, to need for this. So that was really cool. And that was definitely, um, a design challenge where it felt like, uh, I just, I tapped into a lot of gratitude with that because what I'm using, I'm using a free program. It's called Krita, K-R-I-T-A. I'm finding tons of tutorials on many, many different topics, but 
I'm using those and kind of pulling that information in order to learn what I need to know in order to do this. And it's like at, at no other time in, the, in, in history would I be able to find free software like this, uh, the information that I need at my fingertips, the ability and time to learn it and do my own thing, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, apply that knowledge that I'm learning to make exactly what I'm needing at the time I'm needing it. I mean, this is just, it's insane. We, we are so, so lucky. And I, I said that to Josh, it's like, I feel like there's so much negativity these days. And I really try and keep that out of the podcast completely, guys. You know, I really make an effort to just not say anything about it because we've all got enough of it on our plate, right? Uh, and I think there's just, there's not enough gratitude for this amazing world that we have and the internet and all the amazing YouTube videos that are out there and all the things that we can do with this. I mean, we can pretty much do anything that we want. You know, I designed a book and laid it out myself and uploaded it to a print on, design, uh, print on demand printer and now have books coming. I mean, at what other time in history would there not be gatekeepers in my path to stop me at every step? Either making it way too expensive where I couldn't pursue that because of the cost or, you know, just saying, you know, oh, well, we don't approve your book for publication, you know, any, any number of those things. So I just think pushing back with gratitude and just saying, gosh, we, we live in an amazing time. We can do amazing things. And so I'm really excited about this angel and that design and playing around with that. Um, and, and that's going to be something that we have for Christmas. I think that will be really, really fun. So be looking forward to more news on that project. I'm going to probably have to print her a couple times on fabric just to kind of get the right colors going and make sure I've got all the, you know, all my T's crossed and I's dotted, all that normal stuff. And speaking of fun things to do and hang out on the internet, we have many new members of our Quilt Friends Club. This is a special subscription only club for quilters from around the world who really love what we do and wanna help support the podcast and really wanna get off of normal social media and hang out with like-minded, kind, gracious people. And that's what I love about this group. It's just so awesome and supportive. Uh, so you can check it out at Quilt friends.club and a special thank you to our new members Pamela Halter, Gloria Bill, Fran Harper, Carol Hill, Patricia Guillette, Robin Bryant, uh, Dale Castle, Wanda Hardy, Lise Lambert, and Joyce Hatton. Thank you guys so much and each week we do a special giveaway for somebody in the club and this week uh, Vicki Gibson is going to win this stash and dash kit, this uh, organizer and this is a by Annie pattern. And then our next giveaway, which our podcast is every two weeks now. So this will be in our, um, our 100, episode number 118 coming up soon. So this is the giveaway for next week. I thought these really went together nicely, even though I bought them years apart, probably. Uh, Tonga treats, it's kind of a fall strip pack, two and a half inch batik strips. And then a seasonal silhouettes, laser cut fusible shapes, it's kind of a cornucopia with, um, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables and stuff. Yeah, I just, I'm not going to get around to making anything out of it, guys. So I'm going to pass it on to you. So if you would like to be entered into our giveaway and join in a group of supportive, kind, awesome quilters, come and check out our club at quiltfriends.club. And now here is the show all about dream achievements. What are they? How do you tackle it? How do you get everything else out of your way so you can achieve and work on the things your heart most needs to create? Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 117 of the podcast. And today I'm talking about dream achievements. This is making the thing that you have most wanted to create for a very long time and making space for it, how to make space for it, how to make that dream a reality. And I feel like I can talk about this because I have just done exactly that. Uh, this is my new book, Leah Day's Goddess Quilts. It is gonna be available for pre-order starting, I think on November 1st, 2019. You can come and sign up for the pre-order at leahday.com slash goddess. But here's the thing about making this book. This has been 
one of the hardest books I've ever written because it was, it was really hard to figure out what this book was, what it was meant to be. And eventually I just realized, you know, this just needs to be beautiful. It just needs to be a gorgeous picture book of my goddess quilts. It needs to tell that story. But that's the thing that I, whenever I thought of writing this book, and I, and I wanted to write this book for something like six years before I actually sat down and started it, every time I thought about it, I thought of just really beautiful pictures. And so I, I struggled to write it because I kept starting with, you know, words on a white page, and I kept starting, you know, kind of in all the wrong ways. And it was only when I deleted all that text that had taken six months to write, and I sat down and just started with the photos, that it actually all started to work out. And I am so, so pleased with how this turned out. I still have, this is a sample copy, I still have just a little bit more fiddling with some photos to do, but yes, it is almost done. And this feels like an amazing accomplishment. It was harder to write than almost anything else I've written so far but it was also the most rewarding. So like, holding this in my hands feels a little bit like a fantasy come true. I mean, I wanted it to be a real thing for so long, and then now it is. So this is what I wanna share with you guys today, just the how, the why, all that kind of good stuff, and hopefully encourage you to think about creating the dream achievements that you are wanting to create. Um, so the very first thing is, what is a dream achievement? And I think this is gonna be different for everyone. I'm gonna talk through this as if it's a quilt because I'm actually working on a quilt. That's a dream achievement for me right now too. Uh, this is a double wedding ring that I am creating for my mother-in-law. She had a heart attack back in January and uh, it was right after her mother died. And these, this fabric that I'm using is actually clothes, Miss, some of Miss Betty's clothes. And so I feel like this is a very, very special quilt and it's the perfect opportunity for me to make the double wedding ring that I've wanted to make since I first started quilting. I've wanted to make it that long. Uh, it was actually the reason why I got into quilting is I wanted a double wedding ring to celebrate, celebrate my wedding to Josh. And then it's been now you know, almost 15 years and I haven't created this quilt. I haven't created this quilt. And it was just a combination of, of thinking about that and knowing that I wanted to make that quilt and then knowing that I think that this would really make my mother-in-law feel better and to have that beautiful memory of Miss Betty's clothes, you know, all that together just really seemed like the perfect opportunity to make this quilt. So the act of making this feels more special. It feels more important. It feels like I'm doing something really good even though, I mean, I'm just stitching fabrics together, but this feels different from other things that I've stitched together, even hand stitched together. This feels different, it feels more important. And uh, I think that that's kind of our guide. You know, it, it can be also just anything that you've been wanting to create for years. Why haven't you created it? I mean, I think that's a really important question to ask. You know, I know I did not pursue this double wedding ring quilt for years because I just thought it would be way too hard. Uh, or way too time consuming. I just kept putting it off. It was just one day I'll do that. One day I'll, I'll make that quilt. One day I'll write that book. One day. Eventually we're going to run out of days. Uh, I, I, that, that was honestly kind of the realization that I had. It was the beginning of 2018. I uh, picked a word for the year that year in 2018. That was challenge. And then right off the bat, within the very first month of that year, one of my really good friends got sick. She got cancer and it was really hard because um, if I'm introverted, she's like introverted times 17. <laughs> she's extremely introverted. And so I couldn't really be there for my friend. Uh, she didn't really want, you know, people coming around and, and visiting and stuff. So I just, I had to kind of support her in the best way I could from afar. And so I sent her silly text messages and stuff like that and I tried to make her laugh, tried to keep it light and, and just make her life a little bit easier and, and, you know, trying to do good for her. And that really helped. She told me later, you know, she got over, through her cancer and she told me later that that was really, really helpful and that she really appreciated that. Um, but her getting sick, my friend getting sick definitely woke me up 
it definitely shook me up a lot uh, because it felt like, you know, wow, if, um, you know, if my friend who's the wife of a doctor can get really, really sick like this and, um, you know, and, and she had all sorts of, you know, scans and medical procedures and all kinds of stuff and they just kept missing it. You know, if all of that could happen and she could get that sick, then it could happen to anybody. And I, you know, all of those projects that I kept putting off for one day, one day, one day, they just all kind of caught up with me that year. And, it, and I really made a decision that year to stop putting off the things that I really wanted to create for one day, because the days might run out, you know, there's not an infinite number of, you know, supply and things happen, you know, car accidents happen, illnesses happen. And that's something that we absolutely can't control. So that really rocked my world. It was a challenge and it, it forced me to face the reality of more, my mortality more than anything else. I really got focused on finishing my goddess quilts. Uh, and then towards the end of the year, that's really, I really got the idea to write another book that I didn't end up publishing, but in the process of writing that book, it was basically kind of a memoir. In the process of writing it, I realized, the book I need to be writing is this goddess quilt book. I need to be writing this. This is the most important thing for me to create. So in March, I set everything else aside and said, this is what I'm going to make. This is what I'm going to make a reality. Um, and I think that's the first step. You've got to just say, identify what that thing is that you need to create, whether it's a type of quilt or it's a book you want to write or it's maybe somewhere you want to go. It could even be a trip. You know, you've always wanted to climb a particular mountain, you know, something like that. I mean, it can be anything. And I, I truly believe that we should do everything that we can to make that a reality, to follow that little poke that you're getting from the universe. And that's exactly how I felt with, you know, this double wedding ring quilt that I'm working on right now is, you know, I've just, I've wanted to make this for years. Why haven't I made it, you know, before now? And now that I'm working on it, it feels great. It especially feels good because I know I'm making this in service to someone I love. You know, I'm making this for my mother-in-law from clothes that her mother wore, and that feels really special too. Uh, and this kind of reminds me of a quote. I was watching some videos from Jordan Peterson today, and I just absolutely love Jordan Peterson. I think he's very, he's very, very intelligent, but he's able to break down concepts and explain them in very simple ways. So I really like him, and I recommend his videos. And he said something that we should orient our lives around doing the greatest good we can and the world the that the world will make space for you if that's what you're doing now i know that there's it's maybe hard to think of making a quilt as doing some great good for the entire world and it might actually feel selfish that you know saying that, you know, uh, making this thing that you've always wanted to create for yourself, you know, whether it's taking that time or going on that trip or, or making that quilt or writing that book, that that is somehow impacting the whole world. But I actually truly believe that it is because anything that will make you happier, more satisfied, more content, anything that fits that bill is going to make the whole world a better place too. Because if you're more satisfied, you're going to be treating the people around you with more love and more respect and more satisfaction. And they're in turn going to be taking that out and impacting the world as well. So I, I truly believe that it is, it is imperative that we pursue our dream achievements, these things that we really feel this draw to create and to stop putting it off for one day. You know, there's no purpose in putting it off. You know, one day that little poke might just disappear and you might no longer feel any inspiration. I, I truly don't believe that. I've had inspirations that stick around for years and years and years. But I'm just saying, why not? You know, what, what, is, what could possibly be the reason to not pursue the quilt that you've wanted to make for so long? And then to Follow that curiosity and ask why. Why have you wanted to make that Baltimore album? Why have you wanted to make a double wedding ring? What about that particular quilt pattern calls to you in particular? You know, what about it is so special? And I think that you'll find that answer and you may find 
an entire rabbit hole <laughs> of crazy that comes along with that. You know, you might find the journey is only just beginning once you answer that call and make that thing. And that's a good thing. Uh, I shared this a couple podcasts ago, and I truly believe it. It's never, I'm never going to not be busy. You know, my plate is never going to be empty. I am never going to reach a point where it's like, done. I finished it all. My plate is clear. I got all my dream achievements knocked out. Because the second I create one thing, I want to create another, right? Uh, so I want to tell you guys a little bit about my planner that I created. And this is going to come out at the same time. Uh, so this is, it's called Dream Goddess Three-Month Planner and Creativity Journal. And basically, I created this planner as I was writing the book. I, uh, I was having trouble just staying focused. And I, I mean, I've got the podcast and tutorials and a quilt along, and my plate is pretty full, right? But even with all of that, I knew I could have more writing time. I knew I could make, you know, carve out more time in my day to make this dream a reality. And so I just started by, by just I drew out a planner on plain paper and I just started with that and then went from there and I, and I popped it into my uh my program my my bookmaking program and I was like all right how am I going to create this and print off pages for myself so I started doing that and then I kept tweaking it and designing it and changing it up until it was absolutely perfect and so it's also illustrated with pictures of my goddess quilts and each day is broken down with tasks to do a space for gratitude journaling, uh, the uh, basically a snapshot of your week. I always really love that, just so I, if I have any events or anything like that, I keep it in mind every single day. A little space for journaling with three prompts. I need to, I should, and I want to. I find that though the starting a sentence with any of those three things is really helpful because I'm able to figure out all right, what's in my head that's like on my list? That's like, I need to go do that. I need to go do that. I need to go do that. It's like spinning in a loop. I need to get that down on paper so that way I can see it and then go do it and get it out of my head. All those shoulds, you know, those shoulds are just killer. There's all, that's the pressure I'm feeling to do other things other than what I really want to do. You know, the shoulds are obligation. The shoulds are things that I feel like no one else would do that has to be done. And they're the things that can be really, really distracting. And then I need to. That prompt helps me identify the things that, uh, or no, I want to. That's the final one. I want to. That prompt helps me identify what it is I'm actually feeling called to do, what I'm feeling pushed to do, what is actually sparking that light in my brain where it's like, I want to set and stitch on that quilt. I want to make further progress on that other quilt. I want to get that chapter written. I want to get that part narrated. Whatever it is, that goes there. And then I can balance my day around the things I should be doing, the things I need to do, and the things I really want to do. Uh, on the other page, I have a check-in with that dream achievement, the goal of the month and the goal of the week. So that way that is in every single page. So I keep that in mind. And then I left a really big blank space because some days I feel like journaling more. Some days I feel like drawing. Some days I feel like scribbling on the paper in a really angry rage. <laughs> I just left space there. And then I also included a little prompt, uh, you know, a question to help you stay on track. So this journal is entirely about achieving your dream achievement. You know, uh, it's three months. So I have three blank calendar months and then 31 day pages so that way you have 31 days for each month and so it's blank so you can use this anytime you can use you can use it for one month and then not use it for another three or four months and then use it again you know you can fill it in however it works best for you and it's going to help you identify your dream achievement break it down into manageable goals which I think is absolutely key and this is how I made this a reality it's like making this made this and I thought about it you know and I, I kind of was like well what am I going to do with this thing now and I just decided you know I'm just going to turn it into a planner and let's release it and let everybody be able to do something with it and that 
was amazing. And it really was like this goddess quilt had babies in a big way. I mean, this isn't even the only thing, you know, I've got other books that I definitely want to write after writing the goddess book. Uh, you know, I definitely want to write a book on art quilting, you know, on the techniques and stuff. That's the thing. This book is not techniques. This is book is a, an art quilting memoir. It is about the quilts. It is about my life but it is not a technique book. It was not a how-to. It does not include patterns. That's not what it is. And I had to reach a point where that was okay, that my dream achievement was not teaching techniques. That's not what I wanted to make. That's not what that book was supposed to be. And that was really hard. You know, I think for a long time there, I was feeling like, oh, I, I had to include patterns in it, or I had to include techniques. And then I realized, you know, writing a part about, you know, like my son's birth story and then immediately talking about fusible applique just really didn't fit. <laughs> it just really didn't work. And so I had to tap into what is my dream achievement really? And, do, you know, am I trying to make this more than it needs to be? And I realized, yes, that's exactly what I was doing. And then that immediately fixed a lot of issues I was having. And, you know, like I said, it had babies. So that's another book I can write down the road. That's another thing I can create to share the technique side of it. Uh, but that's not this book. And that's okay. Uh, so I think giving yourself permission to create your dream achievement is the first step. And then also giving yourself permission to then run down that journey of figuring out exactly what that means. Because sometimes it's not always as straightforward as you think. You know, it might just simply be make a double wedding ring quilt but it might actually be more complicated than that. It might be make a double wedding ring quilt and then enter shows until you win a ribbon. It might be design your own unique double wedding ring quilt that has never been made before, right? So it can be a lot bigger than you expect, but I absolutely think that it's worthy of being taken on. I also think that this has an impact far beyond ourselves. It's just like that quote from Jordan Peterson, you know, go after the greatest good that you can. I believe that going after that dream achievement and making that thing that you've been wanting to create will make the entire world a better place. It'll definitely make the world a more beautiful place, right? Particularly if what you're making is pretty, right? I think that's important too, to orient ourselves so that we are making what we most want to create ignoring any voices in our heads that tells us that we're being selfish and do it anyway, do the work, right? I think that's really, really important. So how, I think that's the most important question. How, how do we do this? How do we make a dream achievement a reality? And the first and most simple answer to that is do the work, you know, sit down, start writing words. If you wanna write a book, start putting words on a page. If you wanna make a quilt, start prepping fabrics or start designing. Uh, let me run through this. If we're thinking about a quilt, I think that's gonna be the easiest way to really discuss this and kind of break it down. So let's say you want to make a quilt. You've always wanted to make this particular quilt your whole life, you know, or for several years. It doesn't have to be your whole life, but just for several years, you've wanted to make this very special quilt. So what's the very first step? First step is deciding you're going to make it and you're not going to wait anymore. You're not waiting for one day anymore. You're not waiting for someone else to do it for you and write a pattern for you. You're going to do it yourself. You're going to make it a reality on your own. So that's the first step. Next step is to start designing it. And that's not complicated, guys. It is a piece of graph paper, a pencil, and an eraser. That's how I start all of my quilts. All of my quilts begin on paper with a pencil, a ruler, an eraser, and I do a lot of erasing. So that's not a crime, you know, make mistakes. Don't like a line, erase it, start over. Don't draw in pen, that's kind of the point, you know. Uh, design until you can look at it and see the image on the page and there is nothing in that image that irritates you. That's my benchmark. I, I mean, I'm sure other people have different benchmarks, but my benchmark is I can look at that image and nothing in that image seems off. You know, it's works. It's, it's working. It's the right way it's supposed to look. 
it's, there's nothing in there that's kind of going, eh, it's not quite right. It's how I know that I'm not quite there on my angel drawing yet. And I love, you know, I'd love some opinions about that because I can look at it and go, yeah, the background's just not there yet. And it's going to need some more work. It's just not there yet. Maybe I need to start all over from scratch as far as the background because that was really kind of cobbled together very quickly. And maybe I just need to spend more time thinking and, and planning that part of it. And that's the thing. Give yourself plenty of time. This is not a race. This is not a rush. A dream achievement is a dream life goal coming to reality. I mean, the last thing you want to say at the end of that is, well, this would have felt really good if I had given myself more time and less pressure and not rushed it. I mean, that blows. <laughs> Sorry, it totally does. Like, at no point do you want to finish a dream achievement and go, well, it could have been better if only I'd had more time. No, 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 not a good idea. It's definitely not a good idea. Give yourself plenty of time. Clear your plate. Uh, I did have some comments in the last podcast, and, and, I, and I completely respect and, and, and uh, agree to a certain degree. Um, several quilters said, you know, hey, I, I can't just work on one thing at a time. I have eight or nine projects going at once. And if I have only one project going at once, I get really, really bored. And, you know, and that makes me anxious. And then I end up hating that project. And I, I get that. You know, I think everybody works differently. But I have to wonder how meaningful any of those projects are if you're working on eight at a time. Yeah, but then I have to think, you know, I've got one project downstairs on my long arm. I've got another project on the table. I've got this in my hands right now. I've got another two or three kind of in the works. And then I've got about a million quilt tops floating around the house. So <laughs> who am I to talk? <laughs> right? But there's only one thing kind of in my hands, in my heart at any given time. You know, I'm not trying to juggle 17 balls in the air. When I was writing this book, that was the only thing I was writing. You know, I set all other projects aside. I just finished narrating the book. That was the only thing I was narrating. And I was tempted to go straight into narrating Mally the Maker, my, my fiction book. And I just said, no, I need to stop narrating and go edit all that content. And then I can get back to narration again once all of that is edited and done. You know, so it's having that laser focus. It is hard. And, you know, and I am also, you know, one of those types of people. I like to have one project, you know, uh, pretty much in kind of any location. So I have a project sitting on the couch that I can do handwork. I have another project where I can do machine quilting, you know, that kind of thing. And it's nice. But you really have to push yourself to get it done, you know, to, to make sure that that dream achievement is your number one thing, is your number one focus. And that that is the thing that you are committed to making a reality. Because otherwise it could just end up like any other quilt, folded up in the bottom of a drawer and never finished. Right? And that's what we don't want. You don't want to start a dream achievement just to abandon it. You know, I think that that's even worse than not pursuing it at all. You know, because that's, you committed to it. You took it on. You said, okay, pokes from the universe. I'm going to go make that devil wedding ring quilt. You, you poked me into it. I'm going to go do it. And then making three rings and quitting before it's actually put together, right? We've got to see it through to the end. And I think that's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be different for everybody as far as the amount of time that it takes or how you have to put it together. But I do think clearing your plate, at least reducing the number of projects and things that you have on your plate that you have to do on a daily basis, I think that can seriously help. For me to make the Dream Goddess book, the, the uh, Goddess Quilts book a reality, I had to stop making all videos for an entire month. I took the month of July off. I didn't do podcast episodes. I stopped sharing new videos. I just did the Friendship Quilt Along. I did nothing else because I'd already filmed those videos ahead of time. You know, so I quite literally stopped everything else so I could just do that one thing. And that was enormously helpful. I don't think I would have been able to write that book with, you know, one or two hours a day to work on it, which was how much, I, you know, I was getting at that time. It just wasn't happening because that was just not enough time to stay focused on that project, right? So getting back to design, it takes time. 
you've got to be willing to draw a race, draw a race. I like using layers of vellum paper. Uh, you can kind of see through it so that, you know, you might run off on a tangent and try like, I don't know, drawing some crazy vines or something in the background of your quilt and then you decide you don't like it. Well, if you erase it, then you have lost that design and there's no undo button for paper and pencil, right? So it's nice to have that drawn on a piece of vellum paper where you can kind of almost like layers, you know, put that over it. You can see what it's looking like. Then if you decide you don't like it, you can set it aside. That can be in another quilt. You know, that can be an inspiration for another quilt. And that's really useful. And then you're not losing something that you might end up needing, right? And that's very useful. Take your time. I find that the design process, the more time I spend designing, drawing, tweaking, looking at a quilt, living with it on my wall. Sometimes I'll print out uh, a, a picture of it full size so I can pin it to my wall. The more time that I spend with a quilt like that, the faster everything else is gonna go because I will have sorted out and answered all the questions of the quilt in that design process. What do I mean by that? Every quilt has questions. Now, just for an example, this double wedding ring quilt, I'm piecing this using paper pieces. This is the paper pieces double wedding ring. And I had this thought that I could make it faster and easier by not stitching all the pieces all on the edges. I would just stitch the pieces together along the inner seams and then I would fold over and do like freezer paper applique for the edges. Well, that was my theory. I had only took one arc to realize I was dead wrong. And, uh, you know, I, it just totally wasn't going to work. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't bothered to do that test piece and, and stitch it all out and just see how it was going to go. You know, so that was part of the design process. Even though this is a, you know, basically a paper pieces pack, you know, it's uh, not a pattern necessarily, but it's, you know, it's kind of something that I didn't have to really do a lot of design work myself to make it a reality. But I still had that construction question in my head that would have changed how it worked. And so that required experimentation, slowed me down a little bit. But once I answered my question, like, nope, you're wrong, Leah. <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, once I figured that out, then everything went faster from there, right? Then I could prep mass amounts of pieces. I could do all the stitching, you know, the kind of the turned edge stitching at once and really start to batch it out. That really works for me. I like to get everything, you know, prepared. I like to do one step at a time. So I get everything prepared. Then I sew everything into sets of pieces. So in this case, I sewed uh, my four piece arcs and then my three piece corners. I sewed those and got those knocked out, like, and did a mass of them all at once. And then now I'm piecing those together to make my arcs. And so it stayed really small and tidy until this point. And then now I'm getting these big arcs put together. But that's just an example of how sometimes the design process requires a little experimentation, can take a little bit more time initially, but that extra time taken results in a faster process later on. And same is true, your quilting design, you can absolutely be thinking about that as you are designing and drawing your piecing design, 100%. Uh, you know, I, in fact, actually, I think the best quilts are the ones where I draw the piecing design, plan that out, or the applique design, plan that out, and then immediately go into planning the quilting design and figure that out too, because then the quilting design is actually can impact the piecing design. I might change my mind on certain techniques that I'm using in piecing to make it easier to quilt with that, you know, whatever my idea is. And that might also change, you know, the look. I might, I don't know, change a border from straight edges to curvy edges, who knows? just based on the quilting design. So take your time with design. Give yourself permission to play and remind yourself that drawing is play, that it is a creative act that is no more complicated than it was when you were in kindergarten. And that's what erasers are for, for when you make mistakes and you don't have to draw perfectly. And it's okay also if your first drawing of your quilt does not at all look like the image in your head says it should. We, you know, if we're getting a, a poke from the universe to go make something, then we have an image in our head. It's very hard when our ability to draw doesn't match that image in our head, when we just cannot seem to conceptualize that or get it on paper. Keep trying. 
keep going. It'll work out eventually, but only if you keep giving yourself permission to take that time and put that energy into it. It is so much easier to go to a store and find a quilt pattern and make it according to the quilt pattern. I'm not being critical by saying this, but it is paint by numbers. It is. That is following someone else's guide. And really all you're buying with the quilt pattern is someone else's fabric calculation. You know, that's it. You're just buying the fabric calculation to know how much fabric to go buy in order to cut up those squares and rectangles out of yardage. That's it. I'm not being critical of it, but I am pointing out that you can absolutely do that yourself. You don't need to go buy that pattern. You can do it yourself. So after design comes construction. And again, you can, you know, you can have a little bit of a slowdown at the beginning of that just to get the techniques down under your belt. Um, but eventually you will figure out ways of making the construction go faster and easier. Uh, but the biggest thing I think when you're working on a dream achievement is to enjoy the process, you know? And this is part of why I think it's good to clear your plate. Because when you've got 17 things going on, it's really hard to enjoy the thing that you're making, right? It's hard to enjoy anything when your you know, sewing area is a cluttered mess. It's hard to appreciate that you're making that thing you've wanted to make for years when there's just so much junk that it's very distracting and overwhelming, right? So clear your plate and enjoy the construction process. Enjoy learning new techniques. Enjoy making mistakes. And, you know, if you have to rip, ripping them out and putting it all back together again. And understanding that you'll never be at that level of skill again. Because by the time you finish that quilt, you will be far, far beyond it. Right? I, I think that's, um, that's another concept I've, I've been listening to Jordan about. And that is the concept that, you know, when we're getting this nudge to do something that nudge is coming from our future selves. I love that idea, that our future self is trying to say, make that double wedding ring quilt. It will make you a better quilter. It will answer those questions that you have, or it will teach you what you need to know, and you will be a better quilter, so then you can create the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And we just have to be patient and willing to do that learning. Uh, I know that I learned so much doing the layout of this book, and I did this layout completely myself, and I absolutely love it. Um, but one thing I do need to modify, I'm going to change, and that is, you know, some of these full, you know, uh, full page photos that I did, I put in where uh, the the image of the goddess is kind of too centered up. I'm going to flip to a page, and so I need to shift these over. So this was just a learning experience. You know, I, I played with the margins. I played with the gutter. You know, I played with a lot of different things just to see if I could make it work. And it's like, no, it's not going to work. The goddess does not need to go in the crack of the book. You know, <laughs> it's just a learning experience, right? It took me two sample books to get to that point and realize that's just not going to look good, you know, and then I'll probably have to go back in and edit some photos. It's seven pages out of the book. It is not that big of a deal. You know, I know that some people would argue, why bother? But to me, it's important because I look at that and go, no, I'm going to take the extra time to make the book what I think it needs to be. I'm going to go in there and fix that. I'm going to make that the best it can possibly be, right? And sometimes it's going to lead to unexpected consequences. Sometimes that's going to lead to more time. You know, it's going to take longer than you expected. Like I said, just go on ahead and double whatever your expectation is. And that way you won't be shocked whenever it, a quilt ends up taking a year versus six months. Then it won't be alarming when you're mucking around with it for a lot longer than you think you will be, right? And here's the kind of the, I think the last thing, and this is the reason why I created the planner, because this is the thing that's the hardest, and that is staying focused through the messy middle all the way to, through to the end. Um, staying focused, staying on task, sticking with it, not putting it in a bin and putting it away and, you know, or, or letting the messy middle shut you down. And, it, you know, when it gets hard, sticking with it, even if you just have to put yourself in jail and say, all right, 15 minutes every day and then I can stop. You know, sometimes I have to do that with myself. 
Uh, I have to be really, you know, and, and on that book too. I had to, I had to do that sometimes. I know this is a hard part. I know this is challenging, but just 15 minutes and you'll get it knocked out. And that was enough. So really staying focused, clearing the way, clearing your plate, staying focused on your dream achievement. I truly believe that that is the most important thing. Not biting off too much, you know, more than you can chew is also pretty important. You know, uh, that is something that I worked on a lot whenever I was designing the planner is just thinking through and breaking down a reasonable goal that you can actually achieve in a month, you know, and then breaking that down into smaller pieces so that every day you're making a little bit of progress on your dream achievement, but not so much that you feel like you're just killing yourself to get it done. That's not the point. You know, I really want making your dream achievement to be a journey and a positive, not as it won't necessarily always be fun. I can tell you that much, but it will be a positive journey to becoming a better quilter, maybe even a better person, a better wife, a better mother. You know, I, I truly believe that after creating both of these books, that's exactly what has happened to me. You know, I know that I have so much more gratitude for this amazing world that we live in. I mean, I was able to find information that I know would have been blocked, you know, that well, wouldn't have even been available to a common person, you know, even 20 years ago, you know, how to lay out a book with a full page spread and, you know, separate the photos so that they don't get lost in the gutter. I mean, like crazy niche stuff like that. I was able to find the answer on stuff like that. And easily, you know, we live in this amazing time and, I know there's a lot of negativity in the world and I know that it's easy to get focused in on that and that all the ways things are bad. But I think when we start pursuing the things that we most want to create and staying laser focused on that and we impact the things that we actually have control over, which is ourselves and our households, we make the world a better place. You know, we're setting all that stuff aside and saying, you know, no, that that's outside my world, that's outside of my control. I can't do anything about it, but I can make this beautiful quilt. I can do something really, really nice for my mother-in-law. I can make her something beautiful that will hopefully help her heal and get well. And that's all I can do. I think that's not an insignificant thing. I think that's actually pretty huge. I think that is the greatest good that we can achieve and, and hope to aim for it might seem small, it might seem selfish, but I think it's actually way more than any of that. So yes, please pursue the thing that your heart most needs to create. Go after your dream achievement and make it a reality. I hope that you will start today. I can say after creating both books, the planner and Leah Day's Goddess Quilts, it, it really truly feels like I've made something that is way more than me. And what's awesome about this is that I'm not at all worried about the outcome, meaning I made these for me. You know, I am gonna use my planner and journal for the rest of my life. I'm gonna be using these ton tons of these. Uh, you know, every three months I'm gonna grab another one and start filling it out. Uh, I know that I absolutely loved writing this book and now I've finished reading it. So it's gonna be an audiobook too. It has been a challenge but it has been so rewarding. And it doesn't matter if anyone else likes it. That's the thing, I had to reach a point with this and I knew it was weird. I knew it was out there, I knew it was different. I mean, how many people write an art quilting book memoir? I mean, it really is kind of niche of niche of niche. I'm having trouble finding categories for this book, guys. But I made it for me and that's good enough. And I want you to know it's a-OK -okay to be selfish. It's A-OK -okay to pursue the thing that you want to create just for the simple goal of making it happen, making it a reality. I think that's what you should be doing. And I'm going to continue doing this. I have already, you know, thinking about where I want to go from here. I am actively pursuing only dream achievements from this point. Whenever I think of making something new, I always hold this up against that benchmark of like, is this my highest potential? Is making this quilt reaching that next level? Is making this quilt going to push me? Is it something I've always wanted to do or something I've always wanted to create? And if the answer is not yes, then I don't make it. 
You know, I've reached that point where it's that important to make sure that the projects, that the, the time that I'm putting into my work is valuable, not just, you know, making quilts to make quilts, not just making things to keep my hands busy, but to make things so that my life is more meaningful and that I am putting the greatest good, I am, I am aiming for the greatest good that I can hope to accomplish and share with the world. That sounds really highfalutin, but that's where I'm at. So I hope that this has made sense. I hope that you have enjoyed this podcast. If you would like to pre-order either of these books, here's my shameless plug. <laughs> you can go to leahday.com slash goddess. Uh, it is going to be limited only to members of this newsletter list. So if you'd like to be part of the pre-order, make sure to go and sign up at leahday.com slash goddess. We are keeping this pre-order very short, sweet, and simple. You can also already find this book available at barnesandnoble.com. That's also a pre-order. The books will ship in December. So it's a little bit of a long period of time, but I just want to let you know it is available other places online too. So thank you guys so much for listening. As always, I love doing this podcast and sharing it with you. If you have suggestions for more podcast episodes, please post them in the comments below. And if you have any questions, of course, I'm here to answer them as well. Until next time. Let's go quilt.